Yeah, thank you, everybody. So I'm hoping you can all hear me okay. Brilliant. I already feel like I'm on a Zoom call. It's a bit weird. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, th thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I didn't understand m most of what you said. I, I hope that I didn't uh, miss anything important there. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know me, my name's Mike. Uh, I've been in tech for over a decade now. Uh, and I actually got my start in tech over 11 years ago now in an operational support team in a bank. And one of the things that I had to do for my job was go and talk to the teams that were building all the different software products, uh, you know, that all our different teams were using, internet banking, call center agents, all that stuff. And there was this one team that I could go to and I'd say, hey, we've got this issue that the customers have, have started reporting this problem. Uh, you know, they press a button and an error message throws up. Do you reckon you could give us a bug fix? And they'd be like, yeah, no worries. We'll put it on the backlog. Give us two weeks. It'll all be fine. And yet there was this other team that I would go and talk to and I would have a very different experience. So I'd, you know, same thing, the, uh, the, this bug, you press a button, everything breaks. Do you reckon you can help us with it? And you'd get a little bit of a, well, you know, we've, we've got this release that we're planning in the next three months, but we've already got like 300 items on the backlog. Uh, and you know, these releases, they cost us a million dollars. So, you know, don't hold your breath. And that for me was, was fascinating. I was really, really curious why it was that these two teams were just so drastically different in the way that they dealt with customer feedback. Um, I would later find out that one of those teams was a scrum team and one of those teams was what you might call a traditional waterfall team. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guess which is which. Um, but I was fascinated and immediately knew that I had to try and figure out how to help teams maybe work in this seemingly more effective way. And I became an agile coach, I became a scrum master and I spent you know, most of the last 10 years helping teams to get better at responding to, to change, to, to customer feedback. Uh, and of course, I've now found myself in this agile movement that a lot of us seem to be a part of. Um, but this leads me, I guess, to, to the, the news, right? I'm, I'm assuming that by now you've heard the news. Uh, if my clicker works, there we go. Oh, I've already gone too far. There we go. Right, there's the news. You must have heard by now, right? Agile's dead. Am I, I'm not the only one that's been hearing this, right? Um, so you probably don't need to spend as much time on LinkedIn as I do to have heard this, but it does seem like it's coming up a lot in the last few months. Uh, and I've been really curious as to why. I've been trying to figure out what's going on here because it feels like a lot of the time when someone's saying that Agile is dead, it's because they're trying to sell you some alternative to Agile. Um, but there's definitely something going on here, right? There's a real challenge, there's a real issue that, that I think we possibly need to be thinking about. Uh, and so I dug into some stats, I was trying to figure out why this might be coming up and I found some really interesting stuff. So for example, uh, in the UK at least, demand for Scrum Masters now is lower than it has been for any time since 2011. So it's lower now even than it was right in the middle of COVID uh, and you know, even since 2011, which was only a year after the first Scrum Guide was published, which seems interesting to me. I also found that the median salary for Scrum Masters has dropped 10% just in the last 12 months. And to me, this, this is screaming something about uh, you know, an issue in our industry. And you know, maybe it's not just Scrum, maybe it's wider, but it feels as though maybe there's a, a decreased value perception in Agile practitioners. Maybe people are growing a bit skeptical of it. Uh, and so, like I say, I, I really just want to try and figure out what's going on here. And now to see if this works, uh, before I tell you what I think is going on, I'd love to get some of your thoughts. Um, so I've got a QR code on screen. If you want to try scanning that, if I keep my big head out of the way, uh, you'll be able to answer this question. Why do you think Agile might be becoming less popular? Why do you think maybe it fails more often than we wish it would? Uh, what do you think is going on? So you should get just a free text field where you can start putting in your thoughts. And I'll trust you not to put anything rude in there. Uh, and we'll see what comes up. Safe screwed up everything. I knew that was going to come up. I wasn't sure if it'd be first, but yeah, that feels fair. Yeah, remote teams, that's been a big change, right? Management is not agile for sure. That feels very familiar. We're already doing it. Yeah, in some places, I think maybe perhaps we just don't need the frameworks as much because people have figured it out, right? What else we got here? Yeah, it's already a part of everyone's workflow. As a new developer, I have no clue. Yeah, so this conversation probably is one that if you're new into this world, you're probably like, what the hell are you even talking about, right? Who cares? Let me just get my work done. Uh, that's fair. So <laughs> yeah, not clearly connected to, to dollars, right? Do we actually represent or articulate our value? Agile is more culture, less methodology. Yeah, I love it. Agile is not new to anyone, complexity. 
yeah, too much focus on agile rules over agility and value. That's one that feels very, very close to my heart. Yeah, big companies may be too rigid for agile, too many meetings. Everything is a high priority. Doing agile instead of being agile, that's a phrase I hear quite a lot nowadays. Definitely feels right though, right? Yeah, lack of understanding. We think we're already doing it. Yeah, nice. Yeah, shareholders just want to get rid of cost. That, that can be a big one, right? Yeah, more about doing. <laughs> McKinsey entered the scene. <laughs> Scaling agile is still black magic, yeah. They removed all the tech practices from Scrum and it doesn't work without them. I can tell there's another XP fan in here somewhere. I love it. Brilliant. So yeah, feel free to keep adding stuff to that because I will use this data for some future talks, so I appreciate it. Um, there's obviously there's a bunch of stuff here, certainly that I recognize, and I'm sure that a lot of us are seeing a lot of this and, and nodding in agreement. Um, and it's interesting because I've been asking this question in some form or another now to literally thousands of people around the world at different like workshops and conferences and, and all the different places that I speak. Um, and I keep seeing the same things coming up over and over and over again. XP rules, love it. Um, but it, it does feel like just these same patterns keep popping up, right? Which is really, really curious to me. And so I've been trying to dig into those patterns and see if I can figure out what might be going on, see if I can maybe help solve some of the problems that people are struggling with. And I've talked about those problems in a, in a few different ways over the last few years. Oh, is my screensaver going to keep coming on? Let's try to avoid that, shall we? Um, I've talked about these problems in different ways over the last few years, but re recently I realized that I can almost distill it down to what I might call two main meta dysfunctions that I think might be at the heart of maybe 80% of the stuff that we all just shared. Um, so one of those, which feels very familiar from the stuff I saw pop up on screen, is what I'm calling agile commodification. So we've allowed what should be a set of values and principles, i.e. the Agile Manifesto, to be primarily represented in the market as a big set of frameworks that we often try and implement from the top down. And that feels like a challenge for a number of reasons. And I'm not saying that frameworks are inherently bad, right? I, I don't think that. But it does seem like maybe if we've created an incentive for people to push frameworks as a be-all solution to every problem, then maybe we have an incentive to try and make everyone buy our framework or our framework training and then we end up in possibly exactly the situation that we're in right now. And to give you an example of what I mean by that, uh, some of the stats I was looking at are that scrum.org that does a lot of the scrum training, they've trained nearly 700,000 people in the PSM1 certification. So that's like the entry level two day, here's how scrum works certification. Um, when you look at the PSM3, which is the sort of deep applied expertise of Scrum certification, which is maybe the one I have. Uh, that one, only 12,000-ish people have that. So the numbers are 0.1% of people who get an entry-level certification will eventually go on to get the high level, the, the, the expertise one. And I'm not trying to say certifications are the thing that matter, right? Those are not the things that are important here. But that distribution, I think, is telling a story about what we seem to be focusing on as an industry. Right? It seems like we're more interested in creating an ever-expanding pool of entry-level practitioners that maybe know the basics of how to install a framework, and we're not focusing on how to cultivate expertise and create people that really know how to apply this stuff and make organizations better. And I think that maybe explains a bunch of the stuff that you all just shared in that last slide. Uh, but that leads to the second issue, right? So the other big challenge is, is what I'm calling culture conflict. Because, you know, the Agile Manifesto, it clearly tells us some values and principles that we should care about, that we should focus on. But it seems as though there is a big disconnect between those values and principles and maybe the values and principles of our leadership teams, our management organizations, maybe the stuff that they inherit from our traditional project management world. And so teams often feel like they're fighting an uphill battle, right? They're trying to implement these new ways of working. They're trying to work in this different way. But leaders, managers, often without realizing it, are behaving in ways that undermine a lot of what the teams are trying to achieve. And again, I'm not trying to blame anyone for this, right? Like we teach people this stuff. We teach them to behave in this way. And it feels like there's just a disconnect here. And we're doing things that ultimately make things harder. So the question this naturally leads to for me is, well, where do we go from here, right? What do we, what do, we do about this? And as you can probably guess, that's what I'm trying to impact in my own small way. So this is dysfunction mapping. So this is a tool that I originally developed just for me to make my job, my life a little bit easier. Uh, and it's a visual approach to creating experimental, incremental change. Uh, so I've got a question for you. Has anyone here ever encountered a Scrum Master who has thought that their job is just to implement Scrum by the book and make the team do Scrum? Anyone experienced that? 
few hands. Yeah. Sorry. So that, that might have been me because, um, yeah, I was a bit rubbish when I started this, right? That's, that's what I thought my job was. Um, and it turns out that's probably not the right thing to do, right? And I made a lot of mistakes in those early years, but slowly I learned from those. Right? I realized actually what we're here to do is to create incremental change, maybe to experiment, to measure things, things that, that actually get better. And so this is an approach that I've now structured and I've given a name and I go around the world teaching it to people in the hope that I can stop them making the same mistakes that I made all that time ago. And maybe I still make sometimes a little bit today. My clicker really doesn't seem to want to work for me today, does it? Here we go. Right. So what I'm talking about here is a tool to help us improve the system that we're in, right? And you, know, you might recognize the Deming quote who said that a bad system will beat a good person every time. But I feel like the system is this term that we throw around and we often you know, don't make it very concrete. So I like to think of it as these two major elements, right? It's what I call process and culture. So process is the explicit stuff. This is all of the stuff that we can directly control and see, right? It's our visual workflows, it's our review cadences, it's our meetings, it's, it's how we do the work. It's how we claim to do the work, at least. Whereas culture is the implicit stuff. This is the stuff that maybe we can influence, uh, but it's a little bit more unsaid, right? The values and the principles, it's the behaviors that we, that we reward, it's the conversations that we avoid. So again, all the stuff that's maybe a bit harder to control. And you might already see how tightly this connects with that last couple of slides, right, about agile commodification and uh, culture conflict. Because th this problem that we're trying to solve, it's a systemic issue, right? We have to think, think about the whole system. If we don't understand how these things connect, we might inadvertently make things worse instead of better. And so that's what I'm trying to think about, right? How do we influence the explicit, the process, the things we can control, and the implicit, the culture, the things that maybe are a little bit harder to figure out? And it's my view, personally, that process, the way that we work, should be built from the bottom up by the people closest to the work who know what they're doing, whereas culture seems to be primarily influenced by leaders, right? The, the, the choices that we make, the behaviours that we encourage from the top. So I'm trying to think about perhaps how dysfunction mapping as an approach can solve a, a little bit of both of those problems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about process first, uh, and then maybe we'll go and talk about culture a little bit at the end. So... The idea behind dysfunction mapping is simple, and you can see an example on screen here. So this is about building a hypothesis with some concrete measures, some stuff that helps us to test our understanding of the system that we're in. So it has an action that we intend to take, it has a purpose that we intend to fulfill, and it has a dysfunction that we ultimately intend to resolve in hopefully a concrete and measurable way. Now, the hypothesis itself that you can see on screen here is actually built backwards. So we start from the symptoms, the things that we can observe in the organization, the things that people can really see and feel. And so our first step to creating a dysfunction map is to start over here with our symptoms. And so we'll talk about how we might do that. Here we go. So imagine it's your first day. Uh, you've just started with a new team. Uh, maybe you're a coach or a scrum master or a leader. In some way, your job is to help teams to get a little bit better, right? What are some of the first things that you might do? Implement safe? Anyone? Maybe? <laughs> no, hopefully. Uh, yeah, oh, I think we've probably all seen or heard that a little bit. Um, but it, it's a surprisingly common mistake, right? Not necessarily implementing safe, but we do seem to often just jump straight to implementing a solution, a process. We're going to solve the problem, tell the team how to do their work. And that seems to me like maybe not what we should be here for. And perhaps we should be talking to our team, listening. Maybe we should be trying to understand what the problems are they care about. Uh, we should be observing, right? How does the work get done? How does the team collaborate? Uh, and then Gemba, which is, I think, the most important one, especially now, right? There's so much remote working. It's really, really easy to just get sucked into going to all your, you know, your Zoom calls, your Teams calls, just with your team, with the people right around you. And you miss the whole, the big picture, right? You're, you're a part of a system. You should try and explore it. And during all this, this, you know, approach as we do it in dysfunction mapping, all you're doing is writing stuff down. You know, not solving problems, not trying to tell the team how to work. We're just trying to gather ideas for problems that we might want to solve, the things that the team cares about. And we're building that into a funnel uh, of, of ideas that we might use. Um, as a bonus tip, right, this, this approach, in my experience, is really, really good for building trust because people have probably had coaches, leaders, people come in before and tell them how to do their work and they're a bit sick of it. And if you go in with that mindset of, I'm just here to listen and ask, you know, how can I help you? You're much more likely to, to get people along on that journey with you. Here we go, yeah. All right, so 
even this idea of building a funnel, figuring out what, what things we want to solve, can be a bit of a tough challenge in, in my experience, especially if you've been in a team for a long time and maybe you've stopped noticing the things that used to annoy you. Um, and so as part of my dysfunction mapping workshop that I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end, uh, I've created some cards to maybe make this a little bit more engaging, a little bit more collaborative, and this is the funnel building deck. And it's got a, a basically three color codes, types of cards. You've got these prompt cards, the red ones, that are questions that you might ask of people, you know, questions you might ask of yourself, uh, just to get you thinking about stuff and maybe you've stopped thinking about. You've got conversation cards. These represent the things maybe that you hear people say, the things they complain about, the things that are causing them pain. And you know, whether these things are true or accurate at this point, we actually don't really care about. It's just the fact that it's being said is potentially really interesting info for us that we're going to use. And then finally, you've got these observation cards, which represent maybe the problems that you might see, uh, what I often call your spidey sense, right? where you see something you're like, oh, that doesn't feel right. Um, but maybe the team doesn't even notice it as a problem. right? Well, what do you mean we've got lots of work in progress? We, we always just work on 50 work items at a time. That's just how we do things, right? You'd, you'd be amazed how much dysfunction teams potentially just get used to when they stop noticing it. So this is about maybe making that a little bit easier to find. So either way, what you'll end up with is a robust funnel, right? A bunch of issues, challenges, problems that you might want to solve. And now we can start looking for patterns. And what we want to do is try and pull together groups of related symptoms, things that we think might be connected. Right? And remember, we're building a hypothesis here, so we don't know that this stuff is connected. We're just saying, this feels like it might be. Let's explore it and see what we find. So another question, has anyone ever been in an organization where it feels like all you're ever doing is just jumping from fire to fire, trying to solve problems, but you know, it just takes all your time? You a lot of hands for that one. Yeah, good. I'm glad it's not just me. Um, yeah, and that, that's what we call a firefighting culture, right? This is it, it, what happens in an organization where we're constantly just trying to treat symptoms instead of underlying causes. And it's possible in that sort of organization that you can be very busy and you can solve a lot of issues, but nothing really gets better because for every fire you put out, another one pops up. So what we're trying to do here is get to the underlying causes to really solve the reason that these symptoms might pop up. We want to be proactive instead of reactive. And so by looking for these larger groups of symptoms where things might be related, it becomes a little bit easier maybe for us to identify the underlying cause. You know, I don't want to just treat the squeaky wheel. I want to figure out what can I do with my time that's going to have the biggest impact on the people around me and the things that they care about. And so that's what we're trying to do by looking through the funnel in this way and pulling things together. All right, so the example you just saw on screen there of, a, of some related symptoms contained a bunch of things, right? So this is a team that you know, deals with a lot of bugs. They feel like that's all they ever spend their time on. They lack confidence in their releases. It's getting harder and more difficult for them to actually release stuff over time. And when they do release it, customers are often complaining that it's not what they wanted. And so I, as a practitioner, as a coach, as a leader, might group some of these things together and call it a quality theme. This feels like some stuff that's going wrong related to our quality. And so I'm not saying this is the correct way to connect things. I'm not saying it's the only way to connect things. But this is close enough in relation that I'm confident that it's worth spending some time just to run an experiment and figure out, is that what's going on? Are these things connected? And let's see what we learn from doing that. And so now we start to have the beginnings of a hypothesis that we can test, right? So. Our next step is to figure out, well, what do we think is the dysfunction that could be causing this? Right? Why is this stuff popping up? And so a dysfunction in this context, I like to talk about a principle or a practice that's either misapplied or missing, right? something that we're not doing or not doing well that could explain why we're seeing some of these symptoms. So you know, in this case, this team doesn't have a definition of done. Hmm, interesting, right? Could that explain why we're struggling with quality? Maybe. Right? Definition of done is, is there as a way to maybe help with quality. So perhaps we treat that as a dysfunction and we see if things get better. So we explore the thread, see if we're right. So worst case scenario, right? we're wrong, nothing changes, but we learn something. We know maybe we want to revisit. But maybe if we solve that dysfunction, we can impact multiple symptoms at once. And now we've got a really big force multiplier. Right? Our energy becomes a really positive spend. Here we are. All right, so I want to be clear that there are many dysfunctions that you could pull on at, at this point in the, in the journey, right? So this team, for example, maybe they're not using pair programming. Maybe they're not using test-driven development. Maybe they've got silos in the team between dev and test, right? All of those things could be reasons why we're struggling with quality. So there isn't a single right answer. We're just trying to come up with an idea that, that, of a problem that we might solve. And 
we're not trying to say that just because you know the team doesn't use test-driven development, that's a dysfunction in all cases, because lots of successful teams don't use test-driven development, right? And so we're just trying to look for ideas as a team so we can decide what practice we're going to pull in that actually will solve problems that we care about, not just because it sounds good on paper, but because we think it's actually going to have an impact for us. So we can decide as a team which approach to take. Now, uh, the distinction between symptom and dysfunction sounds really easy on paper when I talk about it up here, but when we actually put this into practice, this can be a bit of a challenge. And so, again, it's not a clear black and white. This is where you'll have to use your own brain to figure that out. Um, but an analogy that I like to use that makes it a little bit simpler is when you think about going to the doctor because you're running a fever. So the doctor doesn't actually care about the fever, right? They're not going to just try and treat the, the fact that you're running a temperature they're going to try and figure out what's causing that, what's the underlying condition, and they're going to hypothesize, well, maybe you've got an infection, so I'm going to give you some antibiotics. Now, that also doesn't mean that they just don't care about the fever at all, or they're ignoring it, because if they give you the antibiotics, and then the fever doesn't go away, well, they probably know that there's something else going on here, right? So they might call you back in and look through your notes, and, oh, yeah, you had surgery a couple of weeks ago. Looks like the surgeon left a pair of keys inside you. Whoops. I right, better go in and get those out. And so while they're not treating the symptom directly, they know that the symptom not going away tells them that they need to revisit their hypothesis. And that's exactly what we're doing with dysfunction mapping, right? We're identifying a underlying cause and then tying it to our symptoms so that we can try and address the problem and see if those symptoms go away. And then we'll better understand if we're, we're having the impact that we want to have. Cool. And so that leads us, leads us to our next point, which is considering purpose, right? So this might be the most important step in this whole approach. Um, and I've got a question to demonstrate why. Has anyone here ever had a scrum master or coach say, we should do this because the scrum guide says so? Anyone heard that? A few people. Has anyone here been the person that said that? Yeah. Yeah, me again. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, and this is, this is an easy mistake to make, right? Because we often talk in our industry about best practice, which might maybe convince us that just because something works somewhere else that we should just follow it and, and everything will be fine. But it's not that simple in, in the complex world, right? And it turns out actually saying to people, we should do this because the Scrum Guide says so, is dumb. It doesn't help, right? People don't care. They're not going to follow it. It's, it's not going to stick. And, and a lot of us have probably learned that the hard way. So what we're trying to do here is to take that time to really deliberately ask that question, why? Like why do we care about a definition of done? What's the problem that this is aiming to solve? What's the outcome that's valuable to us that we're trying to achieve? And so this prevents us from just trying to solve the dysfunction, right? Which, remember, we might not even have correctly identified. We could be wrong about what the dysfunction is. Instead, we get focused on the outcome, the improvement in quality, the thing that we care about that we're trying to get from a definition of done. And so we capture this as what I call a purpose statement. You can see a couple on screen here. Uh, and purpose statement is similar to a user story. For anyone who's familiar with those, they're, they're a placeholder for a conversation. They don't capture everything, but they remind us of a conversation that we've had, maybe a conversation we'll continue to have, and they keep us aligned to the outcome we're trying to achieve. They pull us in the same direction. And you might notice here there's a couple on screen because maybe when we're talking amongst the team, well, we care about maintaining standards, we care about putting quality first, and then maybe when we're talking to leaders who've got a different interest or care, then we might talk about technical debt and preventing it from becoming an existential threat for us. So as long as those two things keep us pulling in the same direction or focusing on quality, we're good. We can keep pulling in the same direction. We can work towards that outcome. The trick seems to be pressing the button three times. All right. Um, so this leads us then to the easy bit, right? Come up with a solution. How are we going to solve the problem? Um, I know, how about if we implement a new operating model and 25 new policies and we hire a change team with five new people to manage a three-year change plan? How's that sound? Is that a good idea? No? <laughs> At least a couple of nods in the, in the audience, I'm not sure. Cool. So uh, again, you can tell I've learned the hard way. I, obviously, I'm trying to exaggerate. I'm trying to be a bit funny here, but I'm probably not the only one in the audience that, that gets a bit of a PTSD flashback from that kind of description, right? We've probably been through something like that. Um, and of course, my, my tip at this point is don't do that, right? <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, what we're trying to do here is look for a small change, a small step that will take us in the right direction. And then we're going to see what we learn, right? What happens when we put that thing into practice. And so this becomes the next step in our hypothesis, right? These are some things that we might do to move us in the right direction. And importantly, these are tied to that purpose statement from earlier. They're not tied to the dysfunction because we're not just trying to implement a definition of done. That's not what we care about here. We care about moving towards an improvement in quality and maintaining standards. 
But either way, what we're coming up with is small actions, some little things that we can do. So for example, I might just play a definition of done game with the team to help teach the benefit of enabling constraints. Uh, maybe I'll send a video that just gets them thinking about definition of done and why it might help us. Maybe I actually don't even have an answer, right? So maybe I just facilitate a session and see if the team can come up with an idea on their own. As long as these things might move us towards the purpose, we can see what happens and then take the next small step. And so you can tell I like cards, right? Um, as part of the workshop, we've got the solution deck, 55 potential uh, ways that you might come up with experiments. And so, for example, you might draw the transparency card and realize when you're looking at your, at your purpose that, oh yeah, I could put some visual data on a dashboard so everyone can see the problem and maybe that will encourage us to behave in a different way. Uh, you might draw that facilitator card and be like, oh, I just don't even know how to solve this problem, so I'm just going to get some smart people together, see if they come up with a solution. Uh, or maybe, maybe I draw the cross-team collaboration card. Right, yeah, of course, Team Ignis. They already went through this issue. They solved it weeks ago. Let's go talk to them and see if they've got a solution for us, see what worked for them. Right? You would be amazed how quickly I have seen people come up with potential experiments they can run when they work in this way, when they just draw cards at random. And normally, when we go through this sort of, sort of process, I see people spending weeks laboring over trying to come up with the perfect solution to a problem. But instead, if we just draw some cards at random and come up with ideas, well, now we've got options, three, four things that we might do that we can talk about as a team and then decide which one we're going to take. And it makes it a lot simpler. So now, We've got a hypothesis and we want to test it, right? We need to figure out, we're going to do this action, see if anything improves. We get to the most contentious issue topic in all of the Agile world. What do we measure? Story points delivered, yeah? Velocity, is that what we're measuring? Again, I, I'm guessing that probably some of you have learned the same mistake that I have, because that often can be a painful one. Um, this is a topic that we love to argue about, right, in our world. And you know, Goodhart was the one who told us that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be good measure. So it seems pretty obvious that this is a, a challenging area for us. And this is something that often teams really, really struggle with. How do I measure? How do I make sure that we're having an impact? But thankfully, as part of dysfunction mapping, right, by going through this process in this really structured way that we've just done, actually this becomes a really easy question. Because what we want to do is close the loop. We want to go back to our symptoms, right? The problems that the team really cared about that got this whole chain of thinking going. And we need to ask, well, how would we measure if some of these symptoms go away? How would we check to see if things have changed? And here we go, another card deck, you guessed it. Um, so if teams are struggling with this, these uh, measures deck can really, really help rapidly come up with some of these measures, right? So for example, in there, you've got some what I call hard measures, right? So throughput, cycle time, ways that you can check to see if things are actually improving. Uh, but sometimes, actually, you just need soft, what I call pen and paper metrics, right? Things that you can gather really, really easily, like the time since or the daily checklist. You know, like, did we break the build today? Monday, yes. Tuesday, no. Wednesday, yes. Right? And suddenly, you've potentially got a bunch of ways to check to see if things are getting better. And you know, to be clear, one of those measures on their own might be a little bit dicey. But if you've got five, six symptoms in one of these hypotheses, and you get a measure for all of them, and then you take your action and they all start to shift in the right direction, now you've probably got a reasonable level of confidence that things are improving in the way that you wanted to, right? And so now we can maybe move on to either the next small change, see if things get better, or things don't change. And then we learn that these things are not connected in the way that we thought, and we can revisit and have another go. Cool. So what we then have, what we've built as we flow across here, is a hypothesis, right? In this case, we've got a team, and we're going to start with running a workshop where we're going to play a game to teach the value of a definition of done. And our hope is this moves us towards that purpose, focusing on quality, maintaining our standards. And then maybe, as a result, the teams come up with a definition of done, solve the problem directly, or maybe they come up with a different way to focus on quality. So fine, right? Great. We're moving towards the outcome. But either way, what we should expect is that those symptoms are going to start to shift and things should improve in a measurable way. And now we've got some measures, number of bugs, work outcomes, team confidence levels, ways that we can check if things have actually improved. And now we can check for incremental change, right? See if things are getting better. And one of the big values of working in this way that I've found is it turns out every one of those hypotheses that you're testing becomes its own little coaching card, perhaps, that you can put on a Kanban board. So you, know, you can visualize all the stuff that you're doing, you can limit your work in progress, and you can keep a record of all the outcomes that have been achieved. And this is a godsend for things like 
performance reviews, job interviews, right? Anywhere where you need evidence that your coaching efforts, leadership eff efforts have had an impact, now you can go to your dysfunction map, to your backlog, and talk about those outcomes, which again, they're tied to real measurable things that the team cared about, right? They cared about the quality issues. They cared about the low customer satisfaction scores. We helped those problems to improve, and here's how we measured it in a really explicit way. And that, in my experience, is more concrete evidence of, of our impact than most, 90% you know, maybe of agile practitioners are often able of providing. So that was an example we just ran through of how you might use dysfunction mapping to build that kind of process change, right? Make things a little bit better. But a couple of quick things to, to think about. It's not actually a linear process. So, so we linearize the visual because it helps us to build our hypothesis. But really, this is a series of loops. Right? What we're trying to do here is constantly learn and adjust and go back and forward and, and see what changes, getting a better understanding of the system each time we run through. So it is a living document. It's meant to change over time. Now, uh, like I say, we just talked about process, but I want to revisit something we talked about way back at the beginning because process was one of our big meta dysfunctions, but culture is the other one, right? And so this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, so let's see if we can get some blood flowing. I would like to uh, invite you all to stand up if you've ever been in an organization that has gone through transformation, an agile transformation, something like that. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I thought that might be the case. Cool. All right, so now... I would like you to sit down if you think that that transformation was a complete failure and just didn't, didn't work. Anyone think that? At least a couple, all right. Cool. Uh, now I'd like you to sit down if there were layoffs in the 12 months after that transformation. Any layoffs? Yeah, a couple more. All right. Uh, now I'd like you to sit down if your job personally became more difficult in the immediate aftermath of that transformation. At least a few more. Brilliant. All right, so I think that we've culled about half of the room there, so that's brilliant. Um, all right, so the last thing then, I would like you only to remain standing if you are fairly confident that that transformation was an overwhelming success with little to no negative impacts. So everyone else can sit down, you can stand up if, uh, if that's... Oh, brilliant. At least a couple. Love it. All right, well, so these are the people that should be up here next year to tell us about why it went so well, so thank you. Um, so yeah, the rest of you can, can sit down. Um, right, I think that maybe tells us something possibly that I just like to ask loaded questions to make a point. Um, but it seems clear to me that there's a lot of transformation around. This seems to be how we try to solve problems in big organizations. And often these don't go the way that we want them to. There's a lot of negative outcomes as a result. And so, you know, what does, what does this lead me to? Well, I've been thinking a lot as dysfunction mapping has been out, uh, out in the real world, as I've seen people building dysfunction maps about the things that people are finding. And it's, really interesting to me because it seems like it might be a way that we can look at transformation a little bit differently because it just keeps popping up over and over and over again on nearly every dysfunction map that I look at in the real world that there's this disconnect between teams and the values and principles they're trying to work towards and then leadership management and the things that they're trying to reinforce. Yeah, so teams have the ability usually to focus on that explicit stuff, the ways of working, but that implicit stuff, the values, the principles, that's really, really hard for teams to influence. And so... Think about that team that we just talked through in our example, right? So imagine they're trying to build a uh, new way of working, experimenting with definition of done, trying to improve quality. Well, what happens if in that organization, the implicit values tell us that we care more about shipping stuff out the door than we do about quality? Like what happens if we're trying that experiment, but actually we know we're going to get in trouble if we hold off on releasing something because it doesn't meet a definition of done? Right, so we're probably not going to be successful in that experiment and we're probably going to end up losing our passion for experimentation at all and then things don't improve. So what if we could support leaders and executives to directly influence in a measurable way the culture in their organization to support teams as they build those better ways of working? What if we could tie those together in a more explicit fashion uh, that potentially gives us a way to support that ongoing continuous improvement without leaders feeling like they need to get sucked into these top-down transformation programs. And that obviously is what I'm thinking about a lot now with, uh, with dysfunction mapping. And so I'm going to be honest, it, it 
probably raises some red flags, right, whenever someone's up on a stage talking about culture or leadership. Because uh, I personally have been in far too many leadership workshops where we, you know, talk about the aspirations of our culture and we write some fancy statements and we put them on the walls uh, and then we all immediately go back to doing exactly what we did before and nothing changes. So you know, I'm not trying to do that. What I'm thinking about is something maybe a little bit different. Like what if instead of talking about culture as an aspiration, what if we start to be honest about the opposite, right? What if we start to think about those symptoms that we were gathering before, like for our process, but instead the symptoms of our cultural issues. Like where are we seeing evidence that our culture might be pulling us in a direction that we don't want to go? And then could we use that as a jumping off point to define some experiments to make things maybe a little bit better? And so just like we talked about before, right, gathering symptoms, we're looking for places where our culture might be missing the mark, but we're trying to keep it concrete. What's the stuff that we really see, right? If we care about team morale, where do we see symptoms that team morale is suffering? If we care about collaboration, where are we seeing evidence that collaboration is not where we want it to be? So don't just focus on the aspiration, focus on reality, right? Start with, what are we really seeing? So it's the same first steps to dysfunction mapping, but instead of teams building better ways of working, it's leaders potentially building uh, better culture. And so this gives us a really concrete way to visualize where our culture could use some attention, right? So if we see a lot of symptoms relating to people feeling excluded, well, now we know that we can run some experiments to try to push our culture towards greater inclusivity, right? And it can sometimes feel a bit counterintuitive, I think, when we start focusing on maybe the bad stuff. But in my experience, this is a massive win and, and it's so impactful in terms of making culture concrete for people. Because when we start talking about what that actually means and what the negatives are that we're seeing, it, it has form and we can maybe do something, we can take action as leaders. And you know, culture comes from the root word cultivate. It's meant to be an active verb. It's something we do. And yet we often treat it like this thing just over here that just is. And I think we should be trying to think about influencing it in a really deliberate way through leadership. So now we've, we've thought about that. What we're really doing is just working through dysfunction mapping just like we've already described, right? So building better culture in the same way we build a better process. So in this case, you know, we care about empowering teams. So we're asking, where do we see symptoms that our teams are feeling disempowered? And we might see that people are quiet in planning sessions, that impediments are not being removed, that you know, people are leaving, engagement scores are low. These are concrete measures that tell us that empowerment might be suffering. And so we can define a purpose, why we care about solving this problem, and then we can come up with an action. What are we going to do as leaders that's explicit that maybe moves us towards empowerment, right? Make it measurable so, you know, as a leader, I can run a workshop about empowerment and, and trying to find a way to empower teams, or I can come up with or share or, or reshare a policy that reminds teams of ways that they might find or, or get more empowerment. And again, we're just trying to keep it measurable, we're trying to keep it small, trying to move in the right direction. But what can I do as a leader that will move my culture towards the things that we care about. And so one you can see on screen here, this is an example of a dysfunction map that a chemical company that I was working with put together, which is really cool, because they realized, so they'd recently had some downsizing, i.e. layoffs, uh, but they had fewer people now trying to do the same amount of work as before. And they realized through this workshop that they had drifted towards this culture of overwork, people were stretching themselves too thin, and so they decided to try and address it. And they came up with a purpose statement, right? Why do we care about solving this problem? It's about uh, team productivity. It's about morale. It's about quality. These are the reasons that we care about potentially improving. And then they came up with some actions to support a shift. So we could do more weekly one-on-ones. We could uh, put some specific steps in place to remove meeting bloat. Uh, we could introduce work boards, visualize the amount of work in progress, right? And make visible that there's too much going on. And these potentially are really concrete things we can do right now. And they tied some measures back to their symptoms that they saw. And now they've got a way to take action as leaders and see if things get better. And this one for me is really exciting because this one isn't even a software team, right? This isn't a tech team. This is a chemical company, a very traditional management team. And yet they were able to come up with some specific actions that they could take to shift culture in the right direction. Uh, which I think is pretty cool. And like I say, it's aspirational, but it's actionable as well. All right, so a couple of things to just call out here because it, it's overly simple when I, you've just got an hour to talk on stage. But I want to make clear that what I'm not giving you is a one-size-fits-all solution. This is not a silver bullet and it's not going to solve all your problems. But what dysfunction mapping can do is give you a way to connect those dots. And just like this image here, you might look at your system and you might connect those dots and come up with a plan for change. And it might make things better. But you could just as easily have connected those dots in a completely different way. 
and you still might get to a concrete plan for change that makes things better, right? Because that's the nature of complex systems. There is not a correct answer in this. We're just trying to consider the whole system and then zoom in on, zoom in on the part that we care about and see if we can make things better. And so it's my belief, my hope, that this is a way to maybe start moving away from this top-down framework implementation, right? Because if culture can be influenced from the top by leaders, acting in a really deliberate way to cultivate the values we care about, this potentially gives space for teams to experiment with their ways of working and build those new processes, knowing that the culture is going to support them and change to support them. And you know, I think this is just fundamentally a better, more humane way to think about continuous improvement, right? And this doesn't also mean that it has to be two separate paths because these things support each other, right? If my team is focusing on an experiment with definition of done to focus on quality, and as a leader, I'm focusing on experiments with the cultural change towards empowerment, well, now we've got a visual collaborative approach. We've got a way of talking about, telling stories about what we're seeing and doing, and we can try and support each other. How can my experiments with empowerment support you to be successful in your experiments with definition of done? And these things potentially become a lot easier. So if we lead by example on empowerment, you know, that, that experimentation becomes simpler. So basically, what we've just gone through is a super high level view of dysfunction mapping, right? It, again, it's not a silver bullet, but my hope is that this gives you a slightly easier or quicker path to coming up with ideas for change, for experiments, and being able to really measure those changes and see if things get better. And you know, I know that I've just given you a lot of information to think about, and a lot of it is probably going to just evaporate from your brains the second you leave this room. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to maybe take a moment to just reflect on three questions I'm going to ask. I'm going to just leave a bit of a pause while you think about them. Um, did I say anything in the last hour that has resonated with you? Yes. Brilliant. Is there something that you think you could do tomorrow based on anything that you've learned or heard about today? And then is there something that you could do tomorrow when you get back to your day job to keep this thread of learning alive? Cool. So just try to keep those things concrete. Try to keep it going in your brain. Uh, and you know, on that note, I've got a couple of options you might consider. So I do run regular workshops on dysfunction mapping in those two kind of flavors that I've been talking about, right? So the dysfunction mapping practitioner workshop really focuses in on agile teams, building products, and how we can build experiments to improve our ways of working. Uh, whereas the DML class, this is the new one. I've only run a couple of these so far, but it's, it's uh, improving each time. This is about focusing on leaders and executives, creating those experiments for, for better culture, right? And so you can find out more, obviously, on my website about those, dysfunctionmapping.com. Uh, but I do have two upcoming public courses that those QR codes lead to if you want to sign up. We do those online, so, so you can uh, you know, join from anywhere in the world. Um, but we actually also are running a workshop here tomorrow as part of the conference. Um, so I think we've already got a bunch of people signed up. But if you are thinking about giving this a try, think about grabbing a ticket and coming along, because honestly, it's a lot of fun. I love running these workshops. You know, we, we build teams, we gamify the process, we use those cards that I've been showing you throughout, uh, and liberating structures to kind of just build these hypotheses and learn by doing. So a lot of fun. Um, if you want to attend an online session, go to the QR code. But I would encourage you to think about coming along tomorrow as well. Uh, so that's all the salesy stuff, but uh, I'll also tell you about how you can get some free stuff, uh, because we all like free stuff, eh? Um, so if you follow me on YouTube, I have a channel called Honest Agile, where I regularly put out videos about common dysfunctions and how you might start to solve them. Uh, I write on Medium, uh, we're mainly about Agile practice and how to improve Scrum and Agile ways of working. Uh, and then finally, maybe the most interesting one is the Miro templates. So if you go to the Miroverse, I have a, a, a bunch of templates, but the main one that you might like is a complete dysfunction mapping workshop template with activities that you can run with a team to build a dysfunction map, including digital copies of all those cards that I was showing you throughout. So several hundred cards that you can use to gamify that process, and that's available for free. Uh, and I do have a deal for you as well. Um, I would love some feedback on this talk, like how you found it, what you liked, what you didn't, help me to improve this for the future. So if you scan this QR code, again, I'll get my big head out of the way, uh, you'll be able to go to talker.com and give me some feedback. And as a thank you, as a reward for giving me that feedback, you will be automatically sent a link to that workshop template, so you'll be able to start using that right away. So I would really appreciate that. It really helps me to be a better speaker. Uh, so I'm going to leave that on screen. Here we go. There's a smaller version of it here with the code dysfunction that you'll need to type to give that feedback. 
uh, just while I do my little wrap up so you can go on doing that while I speak because um, I've got a quote from one of my favorite books that always feels like a good place to, to wrap up which is uh, David Marquette in Turn the Ship Around who said one of the things that limits our learning is the belief that we already know something because it turns out when you're in a complex system it's really really easy to solve the wrong problem, right? Things are connected in many different ways, uh, lots of moving parts, and a theory can sound good on its surface, and we can be tempted to just try and implement something from the top. But if we aren't actually measuring and looking to see if things get better, if we aren't checking to see how things improve, then they might not, and they might get worse. And if we're not open to learning from that result, then we're never going to know. So what we should be doing is implying empiricism, right, in the way we work as practitioners. So putting the theory into practice and then learning, inspecting, adapting, figuring out what happens. So dysfunction mapping is not the only way to imply empiricism to the, to the way that you work, but my hope is that it's a quicker way to get to that kind of measurable experiment, to that way of testing to see if things improve. Uh, it certainly has helped me over the years. Thankfully now it seems like a few you know, thousand other people around the world have gotten value from it, so I would encourage you to try it, see if it works for you, uh, and then obviously please reach out to me if you do. I'd love to know how it goes or if I can help you on that journey in any way. Uh, so thank you. That's basically it. I, I'd love to take any questions that anyone has, uh, but thank you all for listening. I really, really appreciate it.